In the past few years, we have seen a huge amount of world records broken in the distance running world. Jakob Ingebrigtsen shattering the 3000m world record, Joshua Chepskai beating Bekele's long-standing 5 and 10k world records. And that goes without talking about the marathon of course, the late Calvin Kipton obliterating Kipchoge's world record in the 2023 Chicago Marathon with a time of 2 hours and 25 seconds, and Tig Zesefa similarly destroying the women's world record in the event. Yet with every new world record broken these days, there is a significant chunk of people who believe that these world records are misleading and devalued as they are a result of evolving technology in the running world and not actually because the athletes have got better. This has especially been pointed out since the advent of super shoes and super spikes, which have been linked with huge boosts in performance, especially over the longer distances. Even with shorter distances, factors like super tracks, where the surface of the track itself is made to be much more responsive and therefore much faster to run on, have been shown to drop athletes' times by a significant amount. But do these technologies really devalue world records? And would today's world record still stand if it weren't for these new technologies? Well, in order to really answer that question, we need to understand where super shoes began and if they really do boost athletes performance by that much. The first example of super shoes, at least in the modern context, can be traced back to the Nike Vaporfly 4%. In its first iteration, as the name suggests, the shoe claimed to be able to knock off 4% of elite marathon runners' times. Now, 4% may not sound like a huge amount, but that could be the difference between breaking today's world record and getting a sort of decently respectable time in the marathon distance. And especially at the elite level, every single percentage point of improvement you can get is cherished, so 4% is a massive increase in performance. In fact, the first iteration of the Nike Alpha Flies, which was another super shoe that that Nike made after the vapor flies ended up being banned by World Athletics for essentially being too over-engineered. They were most famously featured in Elliot Kipchoge's sub 2 hour marathon in the Ineos 159 challenge, but the shoes gave runners who wore them such a competitive advantage over those who didn't that it caused many to accuse Nike of technologically doping, and it put athletes who weren't sponsored by Nike and therefore weren't really able to wear the shoes at a disadvantage. But what exactly made the vapor flies and subsequent super shoes so effective? While two of the most important innovations the Vaporflies had that are now a staple in most super shoes today are the carbon plate and the Peebacks foam used. The carbon plate is literally a curved sheet of carbon fiber that runs underneath the entire sole of the shoe. Now this helps in a few ways. For one, the carbon plate helps compress the midsole foam quicker when taking a stride, which in turn means the foam will be decompressed faster, giving the athlete a greater energy return from each stride. The plate also helps create a rocker effect in the running shoe. As a result of its curved design, when the front half of the plate is loaded, the back of the plate will lift upwards, further pushing you forward. It also results in reducing the workload on the ankle and calf area of the legs, which will improve overall running efficiency, otherwise known as running economy. The other key innovation was the use of a new material for the foam. Instead of the traditional EVA, ethylene, vinyl, acetate foam used, Nike used a PIBA foam, which is more reactive, soft, and energy efficient. On top of that, Piva Foam has a lower density than its EVA counterpart, and allowed Nike to create shoes that whilst look incredibly clunky and heavy, are actually some of the lighter shoes on the market, which would further increase running economy for athletes using the shoes. The energy return in the new Piva Foam in the Vaporflies, labelled Zoom X Foam by Nike, has an astounding 87% energy return compared to its strongest competitor at the time, the Adidas Boost Foam, which only clocked a 75.9% energy return. And all this resulted in the fastest running shoe ever at the time. It was on the feet of first, second, and third place in the men's marathon in the Rio Olympics. Elliot Kipchoge achieved his first world record in the Berlin Marathon with a time of 2 hours, 1 minute, and 39 seconds using the Vaporflies. Bridget Kosage also set a new women's world record of 2 hours, 40 minutes, and 4 seconds in the Chicago Marathon. And both of these times obliterated the previous world records, with each athlete breaking their own respective world records by over a minute. As a result, World Athletics rules on super shoes came into effect, with only one rigid embedded plate or blade being allowed in the shoe, and a maximum of 40mm of stack height, or the height of the foam in the shoe, being allowed in each running shoe. Since the Nike Vapor Flies, many brands have come out with their own competitive super shoes. Adidas have the Adios Pro series, ASICS released their Metaspeed Sky, and Mizuno released this monstrosity. Yeah, I didn't even know what was going on with that. The common adoption of super shoes in elite competition has prompted a conversation that records are only broken as a result of these shoes. Haile Gebre Selassie, the legendary Ethiopian runner, who is a former world record holder in the 5k, 10k and the marathon, just to name a few, claims that with today's modern super shoes, his records of around the 2.04 mark in the marathon would be equivalent to a sub 2 hour time, faster than the current world record held by Calvin Kiptum of 2 hours and 25 seconds. My record would have been uh, under 2 hours, no, come on. <laughs> Serious. With that uh, shoes, if you run, you know, two or three, some, 
Why not in under two hours? Super shoes are a core argument as to why people believe world records are devalued these days, and they're frowned upon because it doesn't require any extra effort from the athlete. The athlete hasn't made any modifications to their training or made some new discoveries in human performance science. There's now just an external engineering factor that has made them much faster, which also seems to go against the spirit of world records. However, one thing that we need to consider is that unfortunately, the time when many of these older world records were broken was when testing for PEDs was even worse than it is now. And therefore, older athletes a few decades ago, whilst they may have not had super shoes, were likely on a concoction of drugs that today's athletes would not be able to take due to strict testing. And I can already see the comments coming. I know, everyone's on steroids, okay? I'm not saying that today's modern athletes aren't on steroids. I'm just saying that they're less likely to be on steroids compared to the previous generation, where testing was very lax. And if they are on steroids, they're likely to be using smaller doses, again as a result of more modern and strict testing. I mean, EPO, which is a drug that boosts red blood cell production, thereby improving endurance, and was used by the likes of Lance Armstrong, among many others, didn't even have an official drug test until 2000. Furthermore, EPO testing after competition was only carried out after 2002, with the IAAF becoming the first international organisation to start testing out of competition randomly. So even after the drug test was invented, athletes could still pump their veins full of the stuff during training, and simply stop when it came close to competition, while still reaping all of the benefits of the drug. I know of course it's not fun to imagine that athletes we regard as legends of the sport were likely juiced to the gills, but we have to face the reality that if many of these guys wanted to take steroids without getting caught, they definitely could. If you look at some of the long-standing names in the world record books, such as Daniel Coleman or Hisham al Gurush, I find it really hard to believe that these guys weren't unfortunate on huge amounts of PEDs. Because although neither of these athletes were caught, it seems strange that after nearly 30 years of sports science and technological development within the sport, we've had no one really come close to something like the 1500m world record. And although Inga Britson very recently broke the 3000m world record, it took 28 years for that to happen. Plus, you look at how much of a prodigy and a generational talent that Jakob Inga Britson is, he's not really come super close to the world record. Sure, Monaco definitely showed us that it was possible, but he's still got a little way to go before he really breaks that world record. And don't get me started on some of the women's world records. I'm looking at you, Flojo. As bleak as it is, we can at least say that athletes are more limited in what they can do these days, having to employ techniques such as microdosing to ensure they're not caught. And whilst this would definitely still give them a performance boost, it's certainly less effective than being able to blast however much EPO you want. Something I do want to point out is that this only applies to world records that have remained for a long time before they were held, which is why I use El Garouge and Coleman as examples. Something like Kipchoge's first marathon world record is, in my opinion, more devalued by super shoes as the time it beat was only 4 years old. And therefore it's hard to argue that testing would have been so much worse in 2014 compared to 2018 that it offsets the effect super shoes may have. So this argument doesn't apply to every record, just the old ones. So to summarise, yes, in and of themselves, super shoes do devalue world records because they are an external factor that has a huge impact on athletes' performance. But when put in the context of the fact that many of the records that these athletes are trying to break were likely achieved by athletes on large amounts of steroids, then I believe that super shoes do not devalue world records as they merely offset the higher prevalence of PEDs the previous world record holders were likely on, that today's modern athletes are less likely to be able to take. Of course, if we have solid evidence that the old world records weren't achieved using PEDs, or at least the same amount that today's current athletes were on, then my point would be void and super shoes would definitely devalue the world records within that context. But ultimately it's something we can never really know. Speaking of world records, if you want to find out about the tragic rise and fall of the current world record holder in the marathon, Kelvin Kipton, then click on this video here. Also I know my upload schedule has been pretty patchy recently, I've just been very busy over the past couple weeks, but I'm definitely going to sort it out and get back on that video grind, so don't you worry about it. But thank you very much again for watching the video and I'll see you in the next one. Happy training!